So welcome to a, uh, another episode of A Worthy Conversation. Uh, this is part of a series that we do on Silver Line, and today we will answer the, or try to uh, discuss the question of how social is a social enterprise. Uh, with me, we have Leila Bengassem. Uh, she is a social entrepreneur and founder of Dar Bengassem. We have Hamad Amin Agarbi. I pronounced your name correctly, right? The family name, Agarbi. Yes. Yeah. And Ahmad Agarbi as well, who are part of her team. Uh, thank you guys for, for joining this uh, conversation. I really look forward to discussing uh, this very uh, intriguing question, at least for me, on, on, on many levels. So first off, uh, I would like to know more about each person. And uh, we're going to start with the lady, ladies first. So Leila, can you tell us a bit about yourself? And then we'll move on to the gentleman. A bit of mine about myself. Uh, so uh, my name is Leila Bengissim. Uh, I'm a business owner since uh, 2006. I used to be an engineer in my first life. In my second life, I, uh, I tried things I like and I tried to uh, survive out of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all, yeah. <laughs> Just like many entrepreneurs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Thank you, Leila. Hamad. Hamad Amin Agribi, 23 years old. I'm studying mechanical automobile and in the other life, as Lena said, <laughs> like uh, I'm living in like the cultural life, doing door guides, uh, also all kind of stuff like I can do by my hands and also to, to like, oh, sorry, I, I forget it. <laughs> You told me being part of festivals, right? Organizing. Yes. I'm a part of like an associ association. It's a cultural association. So I take part of most of their projects. All right. Nice. Thanks, Ahmed. Ahmed, tell us about yourself. Hey, Ahmed Agarbi. I'm 26 years old. Uh, I'm a graphic designer and uh, I do some, uh, I make some videos. Uh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> So Leila, uh, I mean, first off, we're going to start uh, by asking the question of what is a social enterprise? How do we define it? What is really its definition? Uh, and, you know, as a social entrepreneur, I guess you're, you're best suited to answer this question. So tell us. Yes, there are so many definitions about social entrepreneurship, but I think the, the one that I relate to the most is that it's, it's a business, it's a profit generating business that puts people and environment and community first um, before uh, financial profit. So uh, the return on investment is, is measured in, in people impact, in community impact, in environment impact. Um, but of course, it has to be profitable. So it keeps on sustaining its business and creating the impact it wants to create. OK, nice. Simply put, I like that. Uh, so, so uh, you know, being a social entrepreneur with Darwin Gassam and the likes, do you think social entrepreneurship is uh, part of the uh, Arabian history and culture in general? Uh, do we have examples of that or is it just a European concept that we're trying to adopt maybe or a Western concept, I would say? Uh, no, I think uh, social entrepreneurship has always existed throughout centuries, years. Um, it's just, it's becoming redefined and becoming more sophisticated concept, but it has existed um, ever since humanity existed. There are always people who try to find the balance between profit making and um, impact making. And I think our, um, if I look into the Tunisian history and we are now in the Medina of Tunis, there's plenty of examples of people who have put all the profits of their uh, businesses in, in, for example, um, uh, covering the expenses of the students that come from far away to study in Zaytuna Mosque. Um, and often they come from um, uh, villages or towns and they have no relatives in the capital or um, they cannot pay rent. Uh, so there are some wealthy people that lived in the Medina of Tunis who used to have business, profitable businesses and they put all their profits to help these students go to uh, study in Zaytuna. 
And I think um, I think every every history has that. My my aunt used to have a hammam <laughs> in our uh -huh. town, and uh, sometimes people can pay, and sometimes people cannot pay, and it balances out somehow. And uh, of course, she didn't know it, but she's a social entrepreneur. <laughs> Interesting though. So, so can you tell us a bit more about the the madrasa concept, like as a business model, how, how it used to be managed and run? Was it a profit making business or just a you know a social or communal business? Yes. So the Medina of Tunis has uh, a number of um, madrasas. Uh, one of them is a neighbor here, famous one called uh, Bir Lahjar, and uh, it's it's a beautiful courtyard with many small rooms where uh, students that study in Zaytuna University uh, used to stay there. So this, this was a, a tradition since the 15th, 16th, um, 17th, up to 18th and 19th century. And uh, usually there are wealthy people that own farms or, or they own a, um, um, a, a maqha, a cafe, or, or they own a, um, uh, a fundok, like a hotel. Uh, so, and it's it, all the profits, they go into maintaining the madrasa, um, paying for the uh, middib, what we call middib, um, who teaches the students uh, Quran um, or food. Um, in fact, it's not just the wealthy people, usually the community traditionally in the past, the whole community would provide food for, uh, for students in the madrasa. Um, so I think this, this is the best example of social entrepreneurship. Okay, nice. And the students who live, who used to live in the madrasa where they they used to work uh, in in the dormitory, I would say, uh, against their uh, free stay, or they were guests just there to study. No, and, and no they're just there to study in Zaytuna, and um, often often the madrasas they have a a small mosques mosque in it where. Um, um, they, they study the, the Quran Sharia ah, and also they perform their prayers. Um, but uh, most, uh, no, it's, it's usually um, students coming from far away and they, they come from families that cannot afford to pay rent. So I think it's a beautiful example and it's all over the Medina. Yeah, yeah, very nice, very interesting. And, and uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning that the social enterprise, it puts people and environment first and then profits uh, next. So it was more about uh, the impact it creates. So, so, uh, so two questions here. First off, you know, for investors, at least in the modern day uh, social entrepreneurship uh, business model, are, are investors interested in investing such a model that doesn't put profits first? That's one. And two, can you measure the impact of a social entrepreneurship and uh, if not, you know, how would you tell whether it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, I would say? I think the most important investors are the customers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're the ones who keep the business going. <laughs> okay. I, I think the most beautiful um, comments I get from our guests and Darwin Gissim are, uh, often we get guests who have Googled a lot about us who have read, uh, you know, what we have on our website or YouTube channel or, and, and they come and by the time they come here, they know exactly what we stand for. And, uh, and, and often they tell me we are here, we chose to be here because we know what you're trying to do. And we want to contribute to that. And I think that's, that's the best uh, compliment an investor can make, which is a customer. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay. I think every entrepreneur, yes, we, I mean, we're looking for uh, investors to put money in the business, but I think it's much more sustainable to do very good service, to have continuous flow of customers that, that, that will sustain the business better than um, getting funds from investors. Every now and then, of course, you need them, especially now with Corona. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sure. uh, I think, I think um, I mean, you know, cust returning customers, customers that recommend um, recommend uh, our guest house to friends and, and family. Uh, I think that's the real, uh, um, the, the, the best, the best marketing um, that that sustains the business and the job that creates. Yeah. Uh, I think to measure impact, it's a tricky one. There's plenty of uh, 
uh, of economists and strategists and that can uh, that have tools and formulas and uh, statistics um, and interviews you know with, uh, with to, to pinpoint the, um, the impact um, which is very good if you can't measure it you can't improve it it's a very good yeah. number onto things uh, but I think um, a lot of the impact we're talking about, especially when you're talking about society, it's not something you can measure. You know, how can you measure how happy you are in your job? Uh, so it's, it's a tricky question. <laughs> how can you measure the, 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 the positive story that Darwin Gesum does to the Medina? You can't really put a number to it. Yes, you can. I mean, some people will tell you we'll put some, you know, measures and measures that. But it's, I think, I think there's also... Um, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, indirect impact. I mean, yes, the direct impact is the, the suppliers we work with, the jobs we create, uh, but, but also there's a lot of uh, indirect impact. Um, maybe the team is inspiring to their friends. You know, how can you measure that? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of also uh, indirect impact that might, um, might, uh, might not be taken into consideration when we start evaluating it. Um, the impact when when we put numbers to it to that extent yeah totally understood and I, and I agree with you i mean it's same same as like an art piece i would say you treat it it might have a direct impact if it gets sold because you know it's it's giving returns on the to the gallery to the artist and sustaining their life but also you know uh, the people who are viewing it it might impact their lives differently that eventually might have lead them to behave differently within their own communities and lead to some other kind of impact too. So it's very hard to really measure those kind of things. So, uh, so you, to your point, I think yeah, I, I kind of agree to that. So, uh, uh, so my next question uh, would be, you know, uh, if you have a community, and you know, as you said, probably back in the days, uh, social enterprises were probably common in in Tunis, at least, you know, taking this as an example. Uh, do you think having a lot of social enterprises within a business culture defines or acts as a benchmark for the moral and ethical behavior of, of businesses in general? Um, yes, well, you're, you're asking me, I'm an obsessed social entrepreneur and I think social entrepreneurship will save the world, but <laughs> of course, the more Why social not? entrepreneurs there are in the ecosystem, uh, I, think, um, I think it's important, especially in our region, um, it's it's challenging for our governments now to to, to solve every problem. So um, I think I think if 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 every entrepreneur is socially conscious, mm. uh, then this this will decrease the burden on the government, um, which are already struggling to make the impact they should make. Um, so um, so yes, I think it's 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 important if we want. I think we should we should start measuring development in. How happy people are, <laughs> and I think I think this this will come from having um, very social conscious um, eco ecosystem. So so in a way, what you're saying is that if we need a prosperous and happy community, let's say a balanced uh, lifestyle of the community, having measuring how many social enterprises are there in this community would be a good indicator, I would say. Yes, definitely. <laughs> So that's also another way of measuring impact, I guess. <laughs> All right. So, so this brings me to the uh, to the question of uh, corporates. Okay. So the guys that many people, you know, see them as the bad guys, and who have those uh, social responsibility programs that people believe they're only there for PR, I would say. But uh, my question is if if there is a corporation that is doing a social responsibility program that is honest, that is impactful and all that, would you label them as a social enterprise or so you would rule them out? Uh, I think it's not a black and white uh, answer. I think a lot of important corporations have foundations that are doing uh, important work around the world. Uh, but I think to, to be labeled a social entrepreneur, it, it needs to be in the DNA of the business. It's not just okay. on the side. Uh, it's not just like, you know, the profit will put in a foundation to do something. It has to be part of the, 
everything everything we do the whole concept of the business needs to be uh, uh, socially conscious okay good point yeah so so in other words no even if it's impactful and almost <laughs> so so the whole business culture of the company needs to needs to embed those social values uh, in every sense right okay so so in a way the employees are the key shareholders and the communities they serve are also the key shareholders before the actual shareholders. I totally agree. The, the employees are the shareholders and the customers are the are the investors. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Got you. All right. So so having covered those aspects briefly and nicely, I have to say, um, I'm going to ask you about Darwin Gassam. So so I would like to know more about how the idea came about, the story of the place, mm -hmm. and how you're handling it as a business model before COVID and during COVID right now. And before we jump and, and ask the guys, you know, as being part of the team about how they're involved in, in, in it as well. Uh, how the idea came about? Uh, well, I told you my, my first life I was an engineer and then I decided uh, I wanted to work on something that is uh, more impactful, uh, more meaningful. And uh, and uh, I, I, I became passionate about telling a better story about Tunisia and how we can uh, um, brand it better <laughs> in a more positive way. And I started working with, uh, with artisans. So um, since 2006, I worked a lot with uh, especially rural artisans and trying to help them improve their business sustainability and export of their products. And that's where I felt there was a big gap between tourism and um, uh, intangible heritage. So um, okay. I think we're not we're not um, uh, we're not telling the the, the complete um, complete beautiful story of Tunisia when we receive uh, uh, traveling travelers. So uh, this is how I became started researching about uh, guest houses and. Um, Long story short, uh, this little house was on sale. It's, uh, I, it's, it's a big, it's a humongous investment for me, but of course it depends on <laughs> how much you have in the bank. <laughs> uh -huh. it, took, it took many years to, uh, to restore. It was also through a revolution. Uh, but finally we have, um, we have the first Darwin Gessen was started in 2013. Um, and uh, it has seven rooms. It's, uh, it was built around the 15th, 16th century. Um, okay. we, we did all we can to preserve everything you see is original, um, to, to keep the, the um, original architecture, traditional architecture. And um, um, we tried to um, make it part of the community. So, um, so we tried to we work with suppliers around us. We try to recruit people around us. Uh, we try to um, uh, use our profits um, to help young people with, uh, with cultural initiatives. Uh, we try to link them up with our connections um, or give, provide space or provide funding if we can. Um, so, um, and uh, yes, and we're very proud of plenty of uh, cultural initiatives around us that actually started in this dar. Nice. Uh, and uh, finally, what, what can you name some of those initiatives? Uh, yes, Interference uh, started in that corner over there. <laughs> it's the Light also Festival. The association. Yes, and Jerry uh, Medina is a beautiful project that started exactly in this bench. Uh, <laughs> uh, Luarsha started uh, also on that table. It's, uh, I, <laughs> I mean, they are young people with ideas and then, you know, I know people in the municipality or sometimes they need space because they need to meet and it depends on, I mean, it's not, uh, it's it not, I, I'm, I'm not pretending to be a strategist. It's just that opportunities come, you know, course, young people want to do something and then with, with our modest means, we try to, uh, provide what we can to 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 make things happen. Um, yeah, and finally, good. with the profit of Darwin Gesson, this one, we uh, we restored the second one. Um, so we have two Darwin Gesson now, and uh, we have been in operation since this 2013. So it's now seven years almost. We've had 62 nationalities. Nice. 
we work 100% online. I've never printed the catalog. <laughs> uh, we're very much online. Um, I learned a lot on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> You know, how to market the hotel and everything, everything I learned from YouTube. <laughs> and uh, I think, I think um, I'm, despite uh, Corona has been uh, very tough, I think uh, um, we, we're trying to uh, stay together and uh, keep it uh, open and running um, and stay positive. Uh, it's challenging, but uh, Better days are coming, inshallah. Inshallah. So, so here's an interesting note or question or, or you know whatever you'd like to take that. So as a business, you put the people first and the community first. And uh, you know when the crisis, when a crisis occurred, which for example the pandemic, uh, you know you've impacted this community and you've impacted those people. Do you feel now that the people or the community you've served are trying to pay back? Uh, the gratitude uh, or being grateful to what you've given them by supporting you throughout those rough times? Uh, I'm not uh, I, I'm not looking for that, let's say. Yeah, I, I know. But I mean, do you feel that there is some sort of support regardless of, you know, the status or to a certain extent, maybe no? Tough question. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you have the guys next to you. I think, I think we've had. I think we've had positive. Uh, I think a lot of friends and uh, have tried modestly to uh, to help us uh, generate some income. I think uh, yeah. we've had a lot of friends who tried to organize things with us and. Uh, okay. Um, also had suppliers who were very patient with our payments uh, so i think also the team i mean every now and then someone will say uh, you know if you can't it's okay and that touches me a lot yeah exactly i mean that that that's the kind of support usually you know as a social enterprise you 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 would receive eventually because you've given to the community too whether you ask for it or not or you expect it or not regardless i would say so so I guess now I'm, I'm going to move to the guys, uh, Leila, and, and uh, uh, to the initiative that you're, you're, guide, you're building with them, which is the tour guide initiative, I would say. I'm not sure if you have a specific name for it. So we'll start with you, Mohammed. Uh, tell us a bit about the initiative and then tell us about why you joined it, uh, how it has impacted your life, if it has impacted your life, and where do you see yourself going with this? Okay, so first I, I, I started with the workshop. It was like a collaborative design studio. And from then I like start to contact with, make contacts with people. And there is another project at start who's like based on doing like teaching people from the Medina to become urban tour guides. And uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm, one, I'm one of them. I like, I like the idea of it and I start like working with them. And also I start working with Darwin Gessen for the first time as uh -huh. a tour guide. And then they choose me to work with them. And that's how they changed my life completely. Because I, I, I didn't think like if I, I'm going to work here or not, but the opportunity came and I was like, OK, why not? I'm in. Nice. But I, I, I find the family which was very welcome and like the spirit here it's really good and I like it uh, I really like working here especially with all the team and then I bring my my brother also with me <laughs> <laughs> tag along huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were missing uh, some, some like part of the team so I did he decide to work with us Nice. Okay. During so, the, I'm studying also. During his study. Okay. So, so Ahmed, tell, I mean, now we know how you joined the team, but uh, you know, uh, did this initiative impact you in any way? Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts if it has impacted you in any way. I, I actually, it changed my life. It changed the way what, like I was thinking, the way I see like everything around me. Like I, I've met a lot of people from different nationalities and that give me like 
hope to get on the work and, uh -huh. and do everything I can with the team. Yeah, it, it gave you a better view to the future, I would say. Yes, for sure. Yeah, okay, nice, nice. And uh, Ahmed, how about you? So, so we know that your brother, volunt uh, you know, he dragged you into this. So uh, what, you know, I'm sure he's your brother and you want to help, but I'm sure there's also a personal reason why you wanted to be part of this. If, and correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. بالعربي من كفه بالعربي ما في مشكله كيف ما تحب انت طيب ماشي هذه والله فسؤالي اخوك جابك على على التور انيشيتيف فطبيعه الحال انضميت تساعد اخوك سوري وكيم نوت ذا تور انيشيتيف بس بن قاسم بن قاسم سوري يا اوكي اي نيد تو سيبريت ذوز تو so, so how did, how, uh, why did you join? Why did you accept to join, Ahmed? Uh, first of all, uh, because my, my uh, brother, he uh, said to be to, to come to here, come here uh, for working. And then because I'm, uh, as I told you, I'm, uh, I studying. Uh, so wh why not? Uh, I, حبيت نخدم لهني وكاو طيب وصار في اي نوع من تغيير تجاه نظرتك للامور لما انضميت؟ يس فور شور يس يعني مثل مثل كيف؟ لا اي كي تقابل خاصة عباد معناتها من برا معناتها اجانب وتعرف عليهم و سيرتو كي تحكي معاهم معناتها تتعلم برشا حاجات دونك معناتها ال Exactly. Okay. Uh, nice. Uh, so so uh, we're still missing one team member who is Liam. So hopefully we'll 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 have the honor of meeting him later on. Um, so I have to say whoever is gonna watch this episode that uh, uh, Ahmed and Hamad and Liam have have been doing. Uh, virtual tours of the Medina in Tunis and we've been putting them on server line. And those videos have, uh, you know, are really, really nice in the sense that we get to see the city and become eager to go and visit the city too and hopefully stay also in, in Dar bin Ghassim uh, as well. Like so, a teaser. Sorry? It's like a teaser. Like a teaser, exactly. <laughs> like a teaser. So I hope that everyone who's going to watch this eventually will 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 reach out to you guys to have a more personalized tour with uh, with you. Um, well, this is basically where we um, we kind of wrap up the conversation. Um, I'm not sure, Leila, if you have anything you'd like uh, to add. Tell us about maybe what makes uh, Tunis uh, and its community very special compared to maybe uh, other countries in the uh, in the Maghreb uh, or even North Africa. Uh, so maybe we can wrap up with something like from your end, how, what do you see unique about it in this case? I did not hear the first part of the question, sorry. Uh, my, my question is basically to wrap up the conversation. Uh, it would be nice to hear from your own perspective what do you see uh, that makes Tunis city unique and different from other maybe North African cities uh, in that case? Mm. I don't think there is much difference. I, I've been to Algiers and uh, to Casablanca. Well, Casablanca is a very busy city. Uh, Tripoli is a beautiful city, uh, Libya. Mm -hmm. Inshallah, we can visit again soon. Um, but uh, I think Tunisia, well, when I ask um, when I ask people what is uh, most visible when they come, uh, they can really feel uh, the, the blend of cultures. The, okay. I think in, in, in people's faces and attitudes, but also in our 
in our construction heritage, you can see that there are many civilizations sitting together in one space. Uh, but also Tunis as a city, I think that's what I love the most about it, is when you walk in the Medina and it's very narrow streets, and then suddenly you reach Babhar and there's like an explosion, an urban explosion. You move into the, the European city and the pavement becomes the size of uh, three or five alleys in the Medina. <laughs> and, sitting, and sitting next to each other in perfect harmony. I think this is uh, this is like uh, it's 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 magical to be in the Medina, and then it's like you 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 you're going through uh, uh, centuries, you know. <laughs> you're moving from a century to another century as you leave the Medina and you find the European quarter of Tunis, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, I think it's um, it's magical sitting together and telling one story. Um, but uh, but also the Medina is, is also a mix of people. The, the historical urban part of Tunis, um, it's, it's like a hub, it's becoming a hub and I hope it, it develops into a hub of a lot of creative people like Mohammed, like Ahmed, like Slim. I think there's a lot of young people who are, um, and I want to thank you for, for maybe pushing them to, to yeah. discover, discover their potentials and uh, developing a scenario and filming beautiful... Because uh... actually it was the, our first time to do... It was our first time to do those kind of videos. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, uh, that's awesome, guys. So you need to keep on doing it for the sake of your city and for the sake of uh, Darwin Gassam, I would say. Sorry, Leila, you were saying something. Yes, I'm saying that there's a lot of young people who are waiting for um, opportunities to um, to show what they can do and unleash a lot of positive potential. So I think this is this is the the beauty of creating a business and uh, and also Tunis now, especially after the revolution. Yeah, nice to hear that. Nice to hear that. So so. Uh, in this case, I mean, I want to thank you uh, for for taking the time to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, I, it's it's been a pleasure, really, to kind of uh, hear your thoughts out and and listen to the stories and how it even changed the you know Muhammad and Ahmed's uh, way of seeing things by mixing up with other cultures, which represent the city itself, which is a mix of cultures, as you said, Leila. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your insights and uh, we will definitely put this episode up on the platform for everyone to watch it when they can knowing now that Ramadan uh, people have a lot of time at their hands I would say <laughs> so so hopefully they get to see it too so I wish you a good night uh, be safe uh, and we look forward to more of your videos uh, yeah sure. yeah for sure all right Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.